Hello my fellow Godotians, welcome to the GDScript C++ series. If you're already a little familiar with GDScript features and syntax, we'll be taking that existing knowledge and trying to learn about C++ concepts and syntax, as well as some basic information about a program's memory structure. If that sounds good, stick around. So key principles to know. C++ will think everything is a number. GDScript will oftentimes have things like, you know, uh, integers, floats, booleans, and those are all kind of numbers, but then they also have very different types of things like arrays, strings, functions, maybe some objects. All of those things basically break down to being numbers or some arrangement or sequence of different kinds of numbers in C++. Also, C++ needs to know exactly how each of those numbers are arranged and used ahead of time. C++ is a compiled language that compiles to native machine code, so it doesn't have time to figure out how the data is going to be written to memory later on, or what data type it's going to be dynamically. It needs to know everything statically at the exact moment that it's defined. C++ is also very dumb. It gives you the basic building blocks to make exactly the kind of thing that you might want to make, but it doesn't really give you any protections from yourself. You can easily make mistakes and end up causing memory leaks, accessing memory incorrectly, or doing pretty much any kind of like low performance operations without realizing it. So take it with care. Now, first thing to learn are comments. C++ uses double slashes for comments or slash asterisk and asterisk slash to create and closing multi-line comments. GDescript has a similar concept with its pound comments and its doc strings, which use triple quotes. Um, doc strings usually can be assigned to variables, which you can't do with C++ comments, but it's a similar concept. Declarations are something that happen in any language where you can formally declare the existence of a variable, a function, a class, and bind it to a name. These names are often referred to as identifiers or perhaps symbols. GDScript has what, uh, in terms of class declarations, GDScript has implicit declarations where it specifically ties one file to one class. So even if you don't actually have any content inside the GDScript file, it will still interpret it to be a class. Also, every GDScript class must extend some kind of Godot object class. There are a variety of ways to do this. You can directly extend the class. You can extend a script by its path, which then loads the script and gets the base type of that script. You can also extend a script by its name if you have a global script class set up for it. And in that case, it just uses the name to look up the path and then continues on from before. You cannot extend non-object things like array, dictionary, transform, vector2. Um, if you don't specify an extend statement in a GD script, it will just automatically inherit the reference class. So you are always required to extend an engine class for C++ from the engine C++ code. In C++, it's a different story. Files are not equivalent to classes. You have to explicitly declare every class you make. You can have multiple top-level class declarations per file, and every class is, in, is independently inheritable. That is, it doesn't need to rely on extending some existing class from somewhere else. You can just declare them on their own. Classes have a syntax of using the class keyword, followed by the name of the class, and then curly braces, which wrap the enclosing content which is associated with the class, and then semicolons to terminate the statement. Now, most of the time, when you declare anything in C++, you actually won't need both a curly braces and a semicolon, but classes are kind of special, and they require both. Now, you can see demonstrated here, I have some file, and I've created multiple class declarations in that file. You also notice that there are no file paths associated with the classes. I'm specifically declaring names for the class and nothing more. So whenever you reference a class in C++, you're always referring to it by name. Now, C++, and really any language, has things called access levels. An access level determines uh, what access an external entity has to, to get to um, fields uh, like functions, properties, different things inside of a class. Um, there are usually three different types. You can have public, protected, or private. 
And the convention is to have non-public content have a prefix uh, of an underscore. So GDScript tends to follow this in a convention way where they'll have variables that are declared with underscores that are meant to be private or protected and variables that do not have the underscore which are meant to be public. But in GDScript's case, everything is secretly public anyway. So even though it's intended to not be accessible by something else, you really can access it if you want. And, and GDScript doesn't really hide things very effectively. It's meant to be very open and simple. And because everything is public by default, there's no keyword for declaring that things are public. It's all just assumed out of the box. In C++, it's different. It has access to each of these. Now, if something is private, it's only accessible to the class itself. If something is protected, then class which, classes which derive the class can also access that material. And then if it's public, again, anything external to the class can access those members the properties and functions. Properties, methods, yeah. Um, syn the syntax for them is where you have the name of the access modifier, which is modifying the access level, and then a colon. It's aligned with the same indentation as the class declaration, and then the content that is bound to that access level is indented under that header, right, or that heading. So you can have a private integer, a protected integer, both of which have underscores for prefixes um, to indicate their usage, um, which isn't required, but is just a convention that's generally followed. And then you can have public variables, and you can even redeclare any given access modifier so that you can declare a new variable um, under that modifier which can then reference or be initialized by things contained in previous declarations right so i want z to be public and i want a to be initialized with z but i need a to be private so i have to put the this additional private section after the z section um, here are some examples of bad syntax, which are still supported by C++, but you generally don't want to do them. So don't put the content on the same line as the declaration, and then try not to mix up the indentation, as I've done here. Now, classes will default to private access if you omit an access modifier. So just declaring a class will then automatically set things up to be private. In C++, inheritance also uses access modifiers. Okay, so here I have a class-based class with a public access of index, and then I have a class-derived class which has this colon indicating it's extending a class, and then I'm extending a base class. Notice that I'm extending base class by its name, not its file type or anything, and I also have to include this access modifier. If I don't include this, I'm going to be running into problems. See, inheritance access modifiers impose limits on the inheritance of a base class. So if you publicly inherit another class, then there are no changes to that base class being pulled into your derived class. But if you extend it with protected access, then anything that's public in the base class gets pulled down to a protected level of access in how things try to access things from the derived class. So derived class can still get to things just fine because this is a public variable, right? If it were protected, it would be able to get to it. And if it were private, it would not be able to get to it. But regardless of derived class's access of base class, anything else that tries to get into derived class won't be able to access it if it's not publicly accessible which you can only do if you publicly inherit base class. If you do protected inheritance, then only derived classes of derived class will be able to access the int x, which is public in base class, because it would be using protected inheritance to pull in that data. If you do a private inheritance, then it's like derived classes pulling in stuff from the base class and then hiding the existence of it pulling all that stuff in from everybody else. So all the public and protected members contained in base class get brought down to private members inside of derived class. If you omit a modifier, just like, in, just like before, it also defaults to private. So if you don't put anything here, 
things are just going to be privately inherited and you won't necessarily be able to access something like you thought you could. So here's a quick example again. I have a private class which does private inheritance of base. Now it's just as if I declared each of these variables inside of private all under the private access modifier. If I do protected inheritance, then the Y and the Z, which are under public and protected, both become protected in the protected class. The private, which is even more restrictive, just stays as it is and is not elevated to a more loose access level. And then if you um, do public inheritance, everything remains the same. So private stays private, protected stays protected, and public stays public. C++ also has a struct keyword. Struct is exactly the same as a class declaration, but the difference is that it defaults to public access rather than private. So here I can declare a class, base class, which has public in, uh, fields and then public inheritance when being derived into the derived class. And that would be equivalent to me just saying I have a struct base class and it's just by default inheriting the base class and becoming a derived or is sorry, you have a base class and the base class is being natively inherited into a derived class with no modifications. Everything is public by default. Now, do keep in mind that in other languages, the term struct usually refers to something else. So don't get confused with this concept if you start learning another language besides C++. Now, as far as multiple classes per file go, as, as you can do in C++, um, I want to clarify that in GDScript, you can have one top level class only. And it, but it does support inner classes, right? So I could have some class and I can declare a class inside of some class, which is not the class that is loaded when you get the script, but it's a class inside of that class. Um, and the usage would be to preload the script into some sort of constant or access it via a global variable from a script class. Um, and then you could just do some class dot my inner class dot new in order to create an instance of it. Um, so you can get to the inner class from the wrapper class that is the file. In C++, it also supports inner classes, but you have more control over how those classes are exposed because they can be declared within the confines of public, private, and protected spaces. Okay, so for example, in the editor, you might have the tileset editor plugin, which needs to define the dimensions and position of tiles. And you might have the tile map that needs to pull this data in to actually calculate how things should be rendered and where on the screen they should be rendered. So in this case, the dimensions and position of the shapes associated with tiles are kept publicly stored in the tileset. But if you want to define um, the actual tile data that the tileset manages, that's all kept privately and is not exposed to other classes. So when it comes to multiple classes at the top level, you got to be a little bit careful. It's kind of a bad practice to do that in C++. There are a few allowances that you'll see in the Godot code base. For example, you might have an instance where the classes are so interconnected that the engine generally won't want just one of those classes. You can see this in core script language where they have the script server, which manages scripting languages, the script language, and the script and script instance classes, each of which kind of interact with and work with the other objects. So you kind of have to have all of them in order to use any of them. You'll also see this in instances where most of the functionality is contained in some sort of base class, and then you have very, very small changes to some derived class that's just there for usability. Right. So in this case, you have the class pop-up, which can create a little pop-up on the screen. And then you have pop-up panel, which creates a pop-up and renders a little background inside of it. And it just has an extra panel variable and some additional behavior for instantiating the panel and rendering it. Right. It's very, very simple. So these are the kinds of situations where you can kind of get away with having more than one class in a single top level of a file. But a lot of times, You'll want to try to have um, just one file per class. It's not required. So anyway, all of these notes are going to be kept in the Will Nations Dev Deconstructing Godot GitHub repository. Um, it's 
a I think it, I set it up to be public domain, so anyone can just kind of take bring the stuff and use it however they want. Um, the things for the GDScript 2C++ course will be in a subfolder of the Deconstructing Godot series. And the official content for these videos will be kept in the episodes subfolder. There are some extra files outside of that subfolder, which I use for just kind of my work in progress notes as I'm building the series. You're free to reference it, but I can't really guarantee its accuracy or organization. Feel free to check it out though. If you're enjoying the course so far, let me know and comment if you have any feedback about how things are going. Thanks a lot. I hope you stick around for the next video. See ya.